Hi, I'm Mark Graney, and you're watching The Crew Reviews. raise a glass and welcome back our friend Mark Graney who uh always been one of our favorite guests as evidenced by his record number of appearances in the show <laughs> um Mark welcome back hey thanks for having me guys always yeah. fun good well, Mark some of our interviews have by no fault of yours included a little chaos um but no nothing like your latest book can you give our audience a quick overview of what's in store in the chaos agent yeah, The Chaos Agent is my 13th Gray Man novel. Um, so it follows, they're all standalone. You don't have to read them all to uh, to understand what's happening in this one. But uh, this one follows my hero. His name is Court Gentry. He's a former CIA paramilitary officer. And he's trying to lay low. Uh, there's a lot of forces that are after him. But he and his girlfriend, Zoya, who's a former um, uh, Russian foreign intelligence officer, are down in Guatemala trying to lay low when they are targeted by uh, some sort of mysterious enemy. And they learn pretty quickly that the same enemy is the one who's going around the world and targeting um, leaders in the fields of artificial intelligence and robotics. So there's a big cat and mouse between court, this mysterious foe, and a bit of a mystery as they try to figure out what's going on. And they discover along the way that there's a revolutionary weapon in the autonomous lethal weapon that is uh, going to be fielded that will absolutely change the face of warfare for whoever has it. And uh, so it's a big cat and mouse. It's still an espionage novel, um, but it's got killer robots as well as uh, killer humans. There's spies and betrayal. And, um, you know, hopefully it's a wild ride that people will enjoy. Well, it's a, it's indeed a mile wild ride. And as I texted you when I was in the midst of the chaos agent, um, it was giving me legitimate anxiety. Yeah. And honestly, I didn't know this at the time. That was before you ratcheted it up several more times in the narrative. Uh, so uh, my anxiety just grew. Uh, while you were researching this book and fleshing out the story, did you share any of that anxiety as you kind of got into this technology? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the more... Yeah, I initially got an idea because I was like watching Elon Musk talk about artificial intelligence and planting chips in people's brains and all this. And I thought, well, you don't have to look too hard to find a, you know, a villain um, for your next book if, if you want to just sort of fictionalize a lot of things that are going on. And um, then I just started doing the research and I read a bunch of books. I listened to hundreds of hours of podcasts and audio books and um read a lot of you know government publications things of that nature and th the more i learned the scarier it is and the more unsure you know we should all be about uh artificial intelligence and weaponizing it and where it's going to go in the next few years it's it's developing so fast um since 2010 the computing hardware used to build artificial intelligence models that has increased 10 billion percent and it's doubling every six months Sorry, so 10, and 10 billion percent with a, with you, a b yeah you making and that number up or is that i'm like not a... that's real and and every six months the computing uh, hardware that goes into it is double and so you know anybody that feels that their uh, chat gpt isn't sophisticated enough for them right now needs to realize that Right now it's in its infancy, but it has been growing faster than anyone expected and con continues to grow. So yeah, it's 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 definitely a scary prospect. So so we touched on this with Greg Hurwitz discussing his latest novel, uh, Lone Wolf. And those of you who've read uh, The Chaos Agent, Chaos Agent know how uh, Anton uh, Hinton feels about it. But when you think about AI, do you consider it a force for good or evil? And, and how do you think we'll be able to navigate it as humans? You know, I I think, um, well, first off, I have to say, you know, as a thriller writer, I went looking for the dark side. <laughs> so my research was not uh, unbiased. It was a completely biased. Um, you know, the, the, the worst um, sure. things that, that could come out of artificial intelligence was exactly what I was looking for. So I don't 
you know, pretend to to be like, a, you know, giving like a fair shake to both sides. You know, I, I think it artificial intelligence has has been shown to be amazing as far as diagnosing diseases, but artificial intelligence has also been used to create um, neurotoxins and chemical weapons that we hadn't created before. Um, so uh, it's hard to say if it's good or bad. It's like, you know, I think there's a line in the book. It's like, is fire good or bad? It just depends on what it's being used for. It depends on what you need. Um, but artificial intelligence attached to weaponry is is going to be, you know, in the future, uh, the very near future. There's nothing in this book that's science fiction. It's all existing or emerging technology, in, including the various robot systems that are there. And um, and I I just feel like once weapons are able to operate, you know, lethal autonomous weapon is a weapon that can search for, identify, and discriminate Terminator. against a target. Yeah, and then and then decide to act against that target and then kill the target without any human interaction. And if it's doing it at machine speed, um, humans have something called a neuromuscular delay. So even the best fighter pilots have like flown against uh, uh, simulations, artificial intelligence flying in simulators and the, and the fighter pilots have no chance. They, they, they just get smoked because the AI is thousands of times more aggressive and obviously G forces and things of that nature aren't, aren't a factor. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very serious thing and I won't say it's a force for bad, but I will say that, you know, private, companies that are building AI are, are fueled by greed and, and money. And, and, you know, they're going in front of Congress and they're going like, Hey, this is so dangerous. We want you to regulate it. And then meanwhile, they're going to the EU and, and, and fighting against the regulation. They really don't want to be regulated. They just want to say, we're scared about, we're the gatekeepers and we're super scared about what's behind the gate. Um, so we just need more money. Yeah, Chris mentioned the Terminator. It, I always wonder if any sons of bitches ever watched a sci-fi movie from the '80s because it yeah. just it really it really is like to sit on the sidelines and watch it. It's kind of I'm awestruck by. Well, that. you know that you know the Michael Crichton line from Jurassic Park. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, to say that. Yeah, where he's, he's like, you know, everybody was so you know focused on whether or not they could do something. They never asked themselves whether or not they should do something, yep. and I, I think that's where we are. Absolutely. Well, one of the more compelling aspects of um, Chaos Agent was the way in which those in the meat space fit into the AI picture. Um, and when I lay awake worrying about AI, which has been semi-rare, but will now probably be nightly, um, I wonder <laughs> if there's any way to ensure that those of us in the meat space are always, for lack of a better word, necessary, because that's really kind of what it boils down to. Yeah, so what, what I did in the book was... Um... The, the AI program at the center of this is it's a large language model, but it's been given a, a mission, but it's also get, been given, um, you know, offshore bank accounts and unlimited resources. It has the ability to communicate over the phone or via text or via, you know, whatever email. And, um, and I just basically weaponized a large language model and made it a spy, made it, you know, a, a bad actor. And it, it's able to socially engineer humans in the meat space to do its bidding because as, as good as artificial intelligence is and as good as the robotics have gotten, you know, if you need something to, um, you know, need, you need, need something, you know, packaged and mailed, you know, it's still pretty hard to do it. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's humans in this and, and I wanted this, the story to be very grounded and not get, you know, sci-fi. So, right. you know, the, the, it's an espionage novel. So there's, there's villains, there's assassins, there's human beings in it. Um, but the artificial intelligence is social engineering, lots and lots of people in this uh, story to, to do its bidding. And, um, and I foresee that happening in the future. Sean and I were talking earlier, we were, we were, we were speaking about how Five years ago, this book would have been, it would have had sci-fi elements to it. And I was like, I was like, hey, don't you think, I was telling Sean, I'm like, don't you think some of these books are getting kind of like sci-fi? And, and Sean was just like, no, because it's, you know, it's kind of like the world we are in right now. But five years ago, yeah, it would probably would be considered a little bit of sci-fi. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's just growing so exponentially, as I was saying. I mean, it's, it, when, when the leaders of all the artificial intelligence companies do sign things, you know, 
saying beware it's because it's growing so much faster than they anticipate and and these these artificial intelligence agents can um bootstrap themselves they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps they can teach themselves um you know they 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 win at chess because they'll play a chess grandmaster but they have used synthetic data which is their data of their simulations um you know like 30 million years of chess playing you know it's like it knows everything yeah. um people again people who say it's not that sophisticated because chat gpt let them down it 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 is also you know scored human level scores in the um the gre and the um sat and uh, law and the bar exam and all that so um you know it's what's coming down the pipe is very very strong so sean asked if you had anxiety while researching earlier and it was obvious that your research was extensive so can you share a little bit how you conducted the research specifically in the ai field was it was it mostly books or were there key experts that you went to so it was almost all books and honestly the experts i talked to basically referred me to documents to to read um just because my my questions were vague enough to where that would help um you know i, I go i reach out to experts for specific things here and there but as i was building this story this is one of those stories it took me a long time to write and as i built it um, you know, every day I ended up with more questions than answers. And it, it, it was really pulling my hair out writing this book. And I, I think it was probably the third draft or the second draft before I felt like, hey, this looks kind of like a book. Um, you know, <laughs> these these things, these non-connected parts actually connected in a way that I was hoping to. Um, but it was a really, really hard book to write. And so a lot of times, and you guys may have experienced this too, sometimes getting research just slows you down, you know, like a you know, going to experts can really slow you down. And, yeah. um, and when you're, when you're under the gun, sometimes you're just like, okay, I'm just going to have to flash forward in this crap and, and, you know, learn as much as I can and then write about it credibly. And, and some, uh, sometimes the truth is, uh, is boring. Yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes the truth is boring not to get onto another book, but I just, I don't, I don't want to say boring, but <laughs> I'm, I just wrote another book that's coming out in June and, um, it involves the uh, diplomatic security service. Uh, oh, the DSS. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the State Department. So I went to Ghana, uh, West Africa. I spent days in the embassy there and and hung out with the DS agents. And it was really, really awesome. And the guys were amazing and hung out with the Marines and all that. But, you know, I told them, I was like, you know, this is not, when you read this book, it's not going to resemble a day in your life. You know, <laughs> it's, no. it's, I'm basically getting enough out of of, of what's here to write credibly about it. But then when everybody's swinging off of a helicopter or, you know, running on the back of a crocodile or whatever I end up writing, you know, it's, it, it's not going to feel that much like uh, DS. So just be forewarned. And yeah, a lot of times they would be going like, well, yeah. So actually if you'd be here for 18 months before you'd be transferred here. And then uh, the first thing you'd probably do would be like, you know, working on getting the right door locks for this building, you know, and yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no. that's not what, that's not no. what I'm going to write about. <laughs> that would be nope, a really nope, interesting nope. chapter. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't want to spoil any surprises for the readers, uh, but a number of the great gray man supporting characters are integral to the chaos agent story. Uh, Court's always a star, but when you first, when you first add a character, like many of the recurring characters who've become for lack of a better word, beloved by your readers, do you have the strong sense that, yeah, this guy or this woman is going to be around for a while or have the ones that stuck kind of surprise you with their longevity? The ones that stuck have surprised me with the exception of Zach. I kind of, from the beginning, uh, the character Zach Hightower, I kind of saw him, you know, being threaded throughout the story. Um, Fitzroy is somebody that I never thought I would put in a book again. And he's probably been in like four of the 13 books. Zoya, you know, I wrote her as this foil for court and I did want them to like develop a relationship. You know, there's a little mistrust because of the type of people they are and the psychology of what they do for a living. Um, but I, I kind of envisioned her as sticking around. When I wrote the Tom Clancy books, one of the tough things for me was that there's a huge cast of characters and you have to check all those boxes in each book. You have to have Chavez and you have to have Clark because readers want that. And I'm a Clancy reader and I want that. 
but it's hard very to in a fresh way write a series where i've got 19 people that i you know i need to work into this story um yeah. every time it's like what is kathy ryan uh doing you know um so with the gray man series i told myself from the beginning you're not going to have this cast of characters that you're um, locked into putting into each book so I, I have fans that go like, oh, you know, you haven't had Zoya in, in the last book and, you know, that sucks. And it's like, I'm thinking about like the long-term health of the series. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, if, if, cause if you had to have all these characters that people really liked in every one, um, it really hamstrings you in the story that you're telling. Cause you tell different types of stories and your hero is in different situations. And it's not always where, you know, he's driving a bus with everybody else that you've met in the series, you know, riding in the back. I also think you want you want to keep some of the readers guessing a little bit, as my son mm -hmm. likes to say when we watch movies and whatnot. Like, oh, that character has plot armor. Like, it's mm -hmm. they're never nothing ever bad is going to happen. I like that. Yeah. So so yeah so like you want to keep readers on their toes. Like you want to keep them guessing. Like yeah, you know, and I've in the story or not. Yeah, and I've killed off characters before and regretted it. You know, and you know, like wish that I had them back, but I killed them off in the story and. um so, you know, it goes both ways, but, you know, you, you want every, like I said, every book stands alone, but you really want every book to be the best book that you can possibly make at that time. And so, you know, I think you, you want less like official structure that you have to, you know, be beholden to. I think it's better just to, you know, have an organic story and use who you want to use. So let's go back to the, to the research a little bit, but from a different angle. So your books are known for their globetrotting nature, and those who follow you on social media know you often travel a lot to do the research for your books. And you just mentioned, for the you know your upcoming book, you were in uh, West Africa. Mm -hmm. so the Chaos Agent has scenes in a number of locales, both foreign and domestic. And one of those places is one place that Americans really can't get to go to, which is Cuba. So were you able to get there? I didn't go to Cuba and honestly, it wasn't because I couldn't, it was just uh, my schedule didn't work out. I went to Mexico and I'd spent a ton of time in the part of Gu Guatemala months in the part of Guatemala where that takes place. But Cuba, my, it was my intention to go, but just the way my schedule was in that I had a, a three week period, you know, where I was like, okay, this is open for me to travel, but it, it closed up. So um, you know, this felt like a COVID year for me because I didn't get to go the main place I wanted to go. And uh, uh, I just did the research. There's just other ways you can research stuff. I, one of the Gray Man books I wrote, Gunmetal Gray, I wrote that from my couch, even though it's about Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand. Yeah, you were tied um, up, right? You had like a leg in there. Uh, yeah, I had to have surgery on my ankle. And um, I already had the trip planned and everything. Obviously, during the COVID years, we all, <laughs> you know, yeah. we all uh, wrote what we could. Um, the first year of COVID, I wrote a gray man book that took place in Berlin because I knew Berlin really, really well. It was my intention to go there and get an apartment and spend a couple of weeks there. But, you know, at least I knew the city. And the second year, I'm like, OK, when I'm coming up with a plot for the next year's book, I don't have to worry about COVID because I'm sure we'll have that all ironed <laughs> out by year two. So it was in <laughs> India. And I've never been to India. I knew very, very little about India. And then once, uh, you know, it was made where you couldn't go. Then I was like, crap, um, just had to do a ton of research. And I had people on the ground in, in Mumbai that went and looked at places for me and took pictures. And, um, you know, it worked out OK, but I mean, it's always better when you can go. But um, yeah. some, sometimes you can. But there are workarounds like I, I was writing something uh, for Pakistan and mm -hmm. I had been to Pakistan. But the part I, I was writing about, I had not been to. And right. I found some some taxi driver. He had a GoPro and he just for it was like eight hours of him just driving around oh, the city. I and love I was that like, wow, stuff. That's amazing. And I watched yeah. every minute of it. I love that stuff. There's a if you go on Google and type in like walking in Saigon yeah. or what mm -hmm. whatever, it'll sh it'll just be somebody walking for hours, um, not narrating, not showing themselves. It's just walking Sight, down sounds, streets. Yeah. yeah. And and I I get sucked into that like you wouldn't believe. And you um, both, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's very helpful. It's very helpful. Yeah. Well, so what was the most interesting spot you traveled uh, doing research for this novel? Well, probably. Um, I mean, honestly, this place in Guatemala, um, Panajachel, or uh, that's the town, um, Lake Atitlan, which is up in the in the Guatemalan highlands. I wanted a place where Court and Zoya could be on the run, 
uh, credibly be off grid, but also end up getting discovered. And so this kind of skirts, it is, it is a touristy area in a very, you know, backwater budgety way. Um, and th that was a really interesting location. Tulum, Mexico, where a big part of the book takes part. I'd been there before. Um, I went back. Wasn't just for work. I mean, it was, you know, it was also like a family vacation, but yeah, you know, sure. I went, I went to the locations. It was dual use. Yeah. I went to, I went to the locations and, uh, you know, got a lot of good information about it. So, you know, th this was a, this was a book where most of the work was done into understanding the, the science and the technology of it. I'm, I'm writing a, well, a script that takes place in the Amalfi coast. And the only reason I'm doing oh. it is because I want to go back and <laughs> freaking yeah. re research it, but no, yeah. <laughs> replace. <laughs> yeah. I've never been there. That was where we're, my I, wife and I were supposed to go. We we're supposed to go for our honeymoon and then COVID happened. And now yeah. we have like so many other things have just popped up. We've been a lot of cool places. So I, I keep going like, I'm off the hook for the honeymoon yet because we've been in some cool it's, places. It's but... like Sean's favorite got, place in the world. It's, yeah, yeah I, it's an amazing. I, I really want to go there and then go to the Greece as well. Those are two yeah. places yeah. I'd really see. We were supposed to go to Greece uh, spring break and then we found out that nothing was really open spring break. So we mm. postponed that. Nothing that we wanted to see was open spring break. Yeah. Well, Sean has this nice Bible for the Amalfi Coast, which yeah. I got to use. I was there just I said Mark year, the yeah. early version, but it's it's grown since the Down one there. I see. Mark. Uh, good stuff. Awesome. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, listen, we've talked in the past about how Quark's grown as a character and, and some of the ways he hasn't. Um, he's in many ways the consummate loner, and yet he manages to end up in partnerships or part of teams. And there's like this inner tension that drives him to one of those ends of the spectrum and then sort of pulls him back the other way. After all these books, is it becoming more a more difficult task to balance the competing drives, or do you know him so well it's it's instinctive? Uh, that's a good question. It it is it it's tough to to balance them it's you know i've i've created him as a loner i i created him in the early books as you know a little socially awkward because it it makes sense for his character and his background and everything um a, a little bit um you know just a little bit different um but then at the same time to make these stories fun and cool and interesting he's got to interact with a ton of people in a ton of different situations so i tried to build him that his like resource for interacting with other people isn't necessarily genuine. It's just sort of like what he's learned in his training on how to socially engineer or how to, uh, you know, stay, stay on the down low. So he doesn't have this really comfortable, you know, rapport with people, although you have to kind of write that sometimes. And it it is a, it's a conceit in the story is that I do make this guy as, a little bit of a weirdo and people talk about him as, as kind of, a, you know, a weirdo, but then he's got to be, you know, at some point he's got to be pretty suave, you know, as he goes into this, you know, five-star hotel and, you know, talks to somebody, you know, so it's, it's, it's a weird balance. And I've, I've liked developing the character over the years and maybe making him a little bit more, um, uh, urbane or whatever the term is you know he, he's in a relationship now um and he's trying to navigate that he's also very paranoid for lots yeah. of good reasons and um and i kind of explore that a little bit in the early parts of the book you know it's like what would it be like to be this assassin who everybody's trying to kill and then you fall in love with somebody and then you find out something they told you wasn't true would you immediately start building those walls back up and um mm -hmm. I thought that was an that was interesting to me, you know, that I'm known for my action scenes, but those things write themselves. It's it's the sort of the interplay with other people and and all that kind of stuff that's really that I really get into when I'm writing it. Well, and, and if I can pay you a compliment on this, I, I've read I've read stories where, you know, characters set up a certain way and then they do something so out of character and you're just like that it just doesn't. Yeah. With court, it always feels like he's he's working hard to to be social like yeah it, it it fits his loner character so well even when he meshes well even when he has a banter with a guy like zach or or whatever yeah. it's still like you can see that it, it's effort on his part so you yeah you, i think you're accomplishing exactly what you're trying to do there all right thank you thanks for saying uh, that yeah it, because it is this conceit because you're going like 
all right, this is the guy that like sits in the on the stoop and eats a can of beans and uh you know that that's how he spends his night it's like okay now i need him in a tuxedo going <laughs> through this cocktail party it's like how do those both things work but you know that pe people suspend disbelief in lots of ways in these books so I, it's just one more well and plus you have the ability and it, it, it seems to me like that's why you put he and zoya through so much hell is because you know you you can kind of yo-yo back on that a little bit and mm -hmm. make it make it loner court versus yeah pair court. So. exactly uh, so, well, outside of Court and Zoya, who's your favorite character created in the series? Um, probably Zach. Zach has developed um, as a character. Um, in the last couple books where I've had Zach in it, he hasn't been as funny. And I think people like the humor of Zach. But when I wrote Sierra Six, it just wouldn't have made sense for him to be like yucking it up because he's right. in the war on terror. A lot of his people have died. You know, he's going through a lot of tough stuff and it just didn't feel right to have him as the comic relief. And in this book, he's very, uh, he, he's sort of, you know, lost at the beginning of the story. And that's why he, he kind of gets uh, maybe in with the wrong crowd. And, um, and so I had to build that in a way where you, you know, you definitely see his wit and sarcasm and stuff throughout the story, but um, it's, he's a little less of a two dimensional second banana than he maybe used to be, um, which that worked in those stories, but now I want to make him, you know, a, a deeper character and I have more plans for him. So I, it probably, he'd be my, he'd probably be my favorite character. I might like him more than Zoya just because, um, I like Zoya and I like the struggles that she goes through and the vulnerability that she has as well as being really, really tough. Um, I've, last book burner um zoya at the beginning was having problems with alcohol and drugs and it all made sense to me what had happened to her and where she was but you know i heard from a lot of female fans that was like it's so sexist that she would have this weakness and, and you know to me i just laugh at it because it's like yeah the court went through all those same things and on target it was just several books ago and it's like a male and female can both have the same vulnerabilities and the same uh -huh. strengths. And that doesn't yeah. make you a sexist, but you know, you just have to take those knocks. Yeah, you do. Uh, so on the flip side, who's the, um, the antagonist you consider to be your most evil creation? My most evil antagonist in all my books. Oh boy, that's tough. I'd have to remember all my books, which is going to take a minute. <laughs> to take a minute. He's just trying to remember this one because yeah, I'm just trying. Come on, man. <laughs> he's he's got another book coming out. He's yeah. probably already writing the next Gray Man. Yeah. Book. I <laughs> always have a copy of my book close by in case I forget the title of the one we're talking about because I, I kind of a uh, I deal with anxiety by over preparing, so it's like it it hasn't come that where I don't remember. But I mean, best thing, best villain. I mean, maybe Denny Carmichael um, in Backblast. Uh, I thought he had a lot of reasons for doing, being who he was, and doing what he what he did. You know, he's not like Hitler, but he's also a hundred percent a villain. Yeah. So I like him. Um, the third Gray Man book I did, which was you know ten years ago or more than that, twelve years ago, was called Ballistic, and there was a cartel leader named Daniel De La Rocha, and. I, I liked writing him. I was really, he's probably my favorite character in that book. And he was, you know, the villain just because I just thought there was some cool depth and just freaky stuff about that character. So there's a lot of fun to write. Things you could do with him. Well, uh, yeah. going a little bit farther, have you ever written a scene and thought, wow, that's pretty effed up. And where did that come from? <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of times I know where they come from. Uh, I wrote a scene in ballistic, uh, a, this actually really happened and I read about it and at least two other people I know have written this into their books. I think I was first. Um, I'm just going to say, <laughs> I'm just going to say I was first cause this was 2010. I think I, think I know who you, some of those anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so uh, it, in Mexico, a cartel killed a guy, cut his face off and sewed it onto a soccer ball. And, um, and they put it in a bag and put it on his mother's front door at his front, mother's front door and that's just sounds so awful and so heinous and it's like why would you put that in your book and it's like i mean it it there's a lot of story building right there in that line as far you know like the the, the depravity and the links that they'll go um mm -hmm. in my book uh somebody kicks the soccer ball into a yard you know over a fence or something um 
but that was, you know, like a scene where it's like, oh my God, it's so awful to even write and so horrible to think about, but it actually happened. So, I mean, I get a lot of stuff out of the real world. I do not generate that much out of whole cloth. And um, there's really nothing I've ever written that has been cut out. I will say, just if I can expand just for another second, um, one of the Tom Clancy books I wrote, um, I had a guy caught in a honey trap in China. This was threat vectors a million years ago. And he was just this dweeb uh, tech guy that gets caught by a Chinese spy and he's sleep, you know, there's sleep having sex. And then the ministry of state security busts into the room with cameras and everything. And I, and I wrote that scene and I really labored over it because it's so uncomfortable. And the guy is such a, like a doofus and this horrible things happening to him. And, I, when I turned the book in, Tom Colgan, my editor, who you guys know, like comes back to me and he's like, oh, I hate this. He's like, you got to take this out. And I'm like, well, it's supposed to be bad. It's, I mean, it's supposed to be uncomfortable and awful. And he's just like, not in a, not in a Clancy book. <laughs> We're not going this far in a Clancy book. <laughs> and, I, and he is, he's my id a lot. Um, and he, he steers me in the right direction. So I think he was right about it. But at the time I was going like, I went for something, you know, that was just right. really like cringy and for the purpose of the story and I executed it, but I might've executed it, you know, more than he wanted me to. So that one ended up on the cutting room floor. Put it in the next book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a big scene in this that got cut out of this book. The first draft of chaos agent was 189,000 words, which is just stupid. Like, you know, I, I, I don't say that so people go like that's amazing you write such good books it's like you know it i, I overwrite a and lot then, of time yeah and yeah and then i end up editing down but there was a scene in here where zach encounters his <laughs> daughter his daughter um for the first time and we ended up taking it out because it really didn't move the plot forward and i'm going to hang on to that and there, there'll be a place where that will work because i thought it was a you know i i like the scene it was one of my favorite scenes in the book but Tom read it and he was like, listen, we got to shave some stuff. And this does not further the plot. It just sets up where Zach is in his life yeah. when this all happens, which, you know, you can do that <laughs> with in a few paragraphs as yeah, well. Yeah, or you can infer it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do you have a file? Like I, I have a file of, of every scene I cut that I really liked that just in case, just in case you can like cut and paste it back into something or use it as a basis. Well, yeah, I have a bunch of files like that. <laughs> well, you, you, just real quick, uh, Sean, uh, Terry Hayes, we had him on the show uh, recently. Oh, wow. Uh, the Year of the Locust, it came in at uh, 787 pages. So it was like, it was like 200,000 words. Or yeah. Something. He yeah. said his first draft or second draft, maybe even his third draft, was a million words. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but how, so how long was I in Pilgrim? That was a really big book. Yeah, it was it was slightly less than that, but not much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, yeah. Cut. He's, he's like, I cut eight hundred thousand words. I was like, that's in, uh. that's, that's amazing. <laughs> Why it took ten years? Yeah. <laughs> well, when I finished the Chaos Agent, it was around one a.m. and I was uh, I was both wired and exhausted at the same time. Um, one of the thoughts I had in the next day or or, or so, you know, a question I ask myself every single time I read your book is, Oh God, how's he going to top this? And I, and I have no doubt you will once again, but it led to a different question. Um, while emerging technologies kind of give us all new fodder for our stories and fun toys for our characters to play with, are you finding it more difficult or more challenging to write the gray man in a world where the shadows in which he tries to live are becoming scarcer and scarcer? You mean as far as technology? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, I, I think we're all going through the same thing. You know, it, it's like, the days of really cool dead drops and and um, that sort of stuff are 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 going, if not gone. Um, even things like um, passports. I mean, it is impossible to fake a passport. <laughs> you have to be the person. You know, your biometric data is on the passport. You know, um, and and so these are things that you you find little works around workarounds in the story, or you just you just ignore them, you know, because it's like, this is the type of story. If, if the entire, you know, most, most Chinese espionage in reality is, you know, not done cloak and dagger. It's uh, a, a Chinese national going back to Beijing and then going and sitting on a sofa, you know, on the 
83rd floor of some building in Shanghai and talking to somebody where no CIA officers ever going to eavesdrop in or anything like that. Um, so there's a million things and, and technology is always changing. And, uh, you know, it, it, things were cooler before cell phones <laughs> in, in yeah. some ways, because you have, you know, this, this thing in someone's hand is, um, you know, they went from using all these sort of surreptitious uh, secret headsets um, for communications and radios to now everybody just keeps a, a call open on their phone with their with an earpiece in and they can do the same thing i wonder if, if authors are going to start um and we've seen it a little bit going back in time going back yeah the, going back to the early 90s yeah and writing I, stories in that in that setting yeah i mean i think i i think it'd be cool you know i've i've, I've gone retro for parts of books before um one of the clancy books i did command authority Part of it took place in the mid '80s. Mark Cameron just did a, yeah, you know, that's what a, I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah, it was really good, and um, I th I think that's cool, not just for the nostalgia, but like you said, it's just like the tradecraft and stuff was, you know, if it's, it's just next level, uh, cool. Good stuff. So, like Sean, I have no doubt the next Gray Man novel will be just as kick ass as this one. Um, but is there anything? And you told us a little bit. Can you tell us about like what's coming up, the other projects, or news, movie news, film news, TV news, or just book news? Yeah, so the only movie news I have is that they supposedly have finished a script. I haven't seen it um, for the second Gray Man. I don't know uh, when and until they, you know, say, I don't know if they're going to do another Gray Man. They are supposed to. That is definitely on the plan. Um, I saw the president of Netflix talking about, you know, there was some question about whether they were going to, you know, fork over another $200 million for it even though it was the number one film of the year and the fifth um, most watched of all the Netflix films. Um, but then that president of Netflix was gone a couple of weeks later, Scott Stuber. Yeah. So, so um, I, I really don't know um, everything I hear on the inside, which isn't a lot is that things are going forward. Um, my next book release is called Sentinel and it comes out June 25th. And it's the second book in my Josh Duffy series, which Okay. Uh, incidentally, just has sold to be developed for TV um, to Lionsgate TV. Yeah, Armored was the first book in the series. So this is the next one. This is the one I went to Ghana, West Africa to research. Cool. And, so uh, Lionsgate, huh? Yeah, and I spent time with the the diplomatic security guys and you know, I had an amazing time and hopefully people will like the book. It's, it's, it's a, a big wild ride, not a gray man character. No matter what I do, I promise you guys, so many people are going to email me and go, cause this happened with armored and it happened with red metal. It's like, eh, where's the gray man? You know, it's like, you tricked me. There's no gray man in here. It's like, I don't know how else to tell you, you know, other than standing at every bookstore, you know, not at the a gray man novel at the counter when a little when disclaimer you, on the yeah, bottom. <laughs> yes. Not a gray man novel. You know, imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> ridiculous yeah it's you know we should all be so lucky as to have a character that can get pissed at us for not putting in a book so yeah it's yeah two well, books coming out like, come on. like yeah well you know when, when i did red when i did red metal with rip rawlings a few years ago on the cover it's like a big old russian tank firing <laughs> and in the background you see the kremlin and so many people, and you know, and of course it says what the book's about, this war and everything. And everybody's like, where's, not everybody, several people were like, where's the gray man? <laughs> I'm going like, I guess he's driving the tank. I mean, it's like, what do you want yeah. from me? <laughs> it's like, I never said he was there. So yeah, he's driving the tank. That's good stuff. Well, hey, you, uh, you again, you survived the main portion of our interview. Audience, the chaos agent is brilliant and it, terrifying. And I, I loved mm -hmm. it and I hated it. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> Which is probably the best thing that can come out of that one. I'm going to take a sip before we get into it, though. Honestly, it was like yeah. a great, it was like a great horror movie or horror book in that sense, and that it was so entertaining, but yet it really. The last couple books we've unsettling. read, Sean, have been like that. Have yeah, been unsettling, unsettling at yeah. the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, that's powerful stuff, man. Nice. All right. Well, I will start off the lightning round. You know the rules. There are no rules. Um, you and I both have a history of bar as bartenders in, in our history of work. Uh, you've been asked to make a drink called the court gentry. What is in it? Um, Irish whiskey, soda bitters, and um, orange. 
I'm basically making it old fashioned with Irish whiskey, I guess. <laughs> I didn't know that when I started. <laughs> hey, that's my that's my go to drink. Actually. Uh, I'm, I make the best old fashioned. Like I, I don't I know ever, you do. I don't ever buy old fa fashions when I go out to dinner because I'm like I'm just going to be disappointed. It's I am not braggadocious about anything else in this world, but um, I stand behind my <laughs> old fashioned. I mean, obviously I because vouch. I can tweak them the way I want them. You know, I can vouch for that, and I've told uh, several other authors about that because when I came down to Memphis a couple years ago for um, I don't remember which book it was. It might have been One Minute Out, but I don't think it was. Yeah, anyway, it was One Minute Out, and and I had the Mark Graney old fashioned. I think I had several Mark Graney old fashions. <laughs> spectacular yeah i love making them so yeah that's, <laughs> I, so I that would be a court a court gentry drink because i know he likes irish whiskey i would kind of tweak that i just did this other thing and they're like what is his favorite snack and i'm like <laughs> you know if you, my books i don't really talk about him snacking that much you know i think i had to come up with something so M &M's, i said french stickers. yeah <laughs> i said french fries because i he eats fish and chips in irish pubs a lot um so all i had was french fries so i don't I don't know. I what thought that maybe about. I thought you'd either go for something resembling the old fashioned just because, but I didn't. But then the, my other guess was you might go for Grey Goose. You know, Grey Goose. Yeah, oh, Grey Man, uh, Grey Goose. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> okay. Second question. You you also in your past once worked in a medical device company, and we've been talking about cutting edge technology. So it got me thinking. And you and I are close in age. Um, what is the one thing technology wise you thought we'd see now as a regularity? Would it be something like bionics like the like steve austin or flying cars or something else um well specific to medical technology there were things on the horizon you know 25 years ago that still are on the horizon and that surprises me i actually i don't know if you're asking this is this is this a leading question do you know where i'm going with this already no no i have no all idea right, right. <laughs> this is pretty pretty impressive um <laughs> Back in 2002, I got hurt really bad um, playing soccer. And then I had a surgery where they messed, the, the doctor messed up. So I had some corrective surgeries that didn't really work. And so in 2004, I had two of my spinal, my, my lumbar discs removed and replaced with artificial joints. And at the time it wasn't even FDA approved, but I worked for Medtronic and um, the surgeon was able to call it a custom device. Um, even though I think it was just off the shelf implants, you know, and they put it in and it's, it's worked for me so well. And they've been doing it in Europe since the eighties. Um, uh, artificial discs in the neck are pretty common, but down there in the lumbar region, it's, there's some other complications that make, that make it a little bit dicier, but um, they've been doing it in Europe forever, but it's still not completely FDA cleared in the U S. So it, that surprises me because it, it worked well for me and you know, at the time, everybody was talking about these things. The question was whether or not it was better than a fusion, um, which is the other thing they do, where they just grow the bone together and they put some rods and screws in. Um, I think it is totally better than a fusion because you're up and walking the next day with an artificial discs. And, um, you know, within a, a few weeks, I was, you know, pretty, I, I was, I was feeling better within about three days. And with a fusion, you're basically locked into that for a lot longer. So I, that's the only thing that comes to mind is like something that like, I, I can't believe, you know, I've got this 20 year old uh, implants in my back and um, they're still not cleared, FDA cleared. I was going to say, Mark Graney, not FDA approved. Yeah, I'm not FDA approved. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I don't know if you practice uh, anything that makes you give up something for Lent, but let's just pretend you do. What are you giving up for Lent? You know, I've cut back on, as as I have a sip, I've cut back on alcohol a whole lot recently. Um, I think, I don't, I never had a, you know, I don't think I ever had a problem with it, but like, you know, just with COVID, it was just easier to start drinking. There wasn't anything else going on, you know. You've seen just, our shows? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just start drinking a little bit earlier, you know, and, um, and then when you drink a little bit earlier, then there's just more time at night, which is your normal time to have a drink and you end up with more drinks. And so, um, gosh, like last fall, I, I said, you know, it's, let's just see, you know, let's just make sure I don't have a problem. And I, I didn't, I, I didn't do like a whole dry month, but you know, um, I just, you know, I'll have one drink 
a few times a week <laughs> as opposed to, I yeah. mean, in the COVID days, I mean, it, you can't oh, yeah. really say it because we you know, know, you know how it is when you're at the doctor and they're like, do you have one drink a week, three drinks <laughs> a week or five or more? And you're going, Whoa. Uh, so I'm in the same group as <laughs> what somebody, are you insinuating? <laughs> yeah. I'm in the same group of people that drink, you know, like a fifth of gin twice a day. I did drink I had, January and, and you did. I had one day, I had one day we had already had plans for this booze oriented event. Yeah. So I was like, right, I'm gonna have to trade out a March day, but it, yeah. it, it, I successfully did it. And yeah, did that's it. awesome. I got to January 19th. So that's great. That's great. Real quick follow up question. Um, what would be hard? What would Allison's Lent, Linton give up be? What would she not want to give up? Um, saying that's what she said. Anytime somebody says anything <laughs> that in any way, <laughs> Or, or even if it's not relevant, um, yeah, yeah the, even better when it's not relevant. Her, that's what she said. Is <laughs> it's so you can't get away from it. To where I've actually changed my, you know, like I will be very careful about what I say because it's like let's not fire that up right now. I can't. <laughs> I, I was grilling on the smoker the other day. I mean, and and I came in, and I and I said, um, I got them all off except for the big one. And of course, she's just like going screaming. That's what she's just screaming it. You walked and right I, into that. I, I, know, I, walked, I walked right into it. But the sad part was right after that, I go, uh, as, as soon as that came out of my mouth, I regretted it. And then, I, and then of course, she did the whole thing again. And I was like, Shh. yeah, so love it. Love it. Love it. she'll never give that up for Lent. Who am I kidding? But um, that's great. I can dream. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so my turn. Uh, if at birth God granted you the choice of which country to be born into, with the caveat that it could not be a Western nation, which country would you select? It couldn't be a Western nation. Nope. So uh, it'd have to be Asia or Africa or. Yep. Wow. Um, the only places I've been in Asia are Beijing and Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong's really cool. It's super hot and humid, super crowded. And um, the the smell of durian fruit is enough reason to not go to. <laughs> I don't know what that <laughs> smell is, but it doesn't sound good. Right? Oh, it, yeah. A durian is this fruit that is, it smells like it really, it smells like a dead body that's been soaking in salad dressing. That's how I describe what? it, um, which is nobody's favorite. And, and uh, I've never eaten it, but I've, I mean, I've basically, you know, walked by markets where they're cutting it open and I'm going like, oh my God, somebody died, you know, Why? last know. fall. And it's, it's, you know, people like it. Um, so I'm getting off subject so much for a lightning round. I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> um, on my, the crew you know, you. I, I, I was in Ghana. I, I liked, I liked West Africa. I mean, obviously it's an impoverished place, but the people were just so nice and so warm and, and. You know, you just, I didn't meet a stranger the whole time I was there. So, you right. know, if it wasn't a Western country, I'd probably, it would probably be some island, Tahiti or something. I've never even been there, but, um, you know, it, I would choose that over West Africa, but <laughs> yeah, I, I did have a nice time in West <laughs> Africa. Yeah. Uh, all right. So in September of 2023, a dozen prominent authors sued open AI, accusing the, the artificial intelligence company of infringing on authors copyrights claiming it used their books to train its jet GPT chatbot. What are you, what do you think are the chances the author succeed in that lawsuit? You know, I don't know the law very well. I, I don't think that, I don't think, you know, I, I just, just ego and, and greed is just completely fueling the, the hunt for the latest and greatest AI and, these aren't people that are going to be like, let's settle for hundreds of billions of dollars or whatever. I'm several, uh, nine of my books were in the data that they used. Who were they? Yeah. And, um, and, you know, people were like, are you mad about that? And, you know, I was writing this book at the time or I'd finished this <laughs> book and, and I was like, yeah, that's not the worst thing AI is going to do to me. Uh, <laughs> you got other problems I'm to worry about. Into, I'm going to keep it in perspective. Stealing my uh, intellectual property is pretty low on the list of, of what's going to go wrong with this uh, technology in the future. But no, it's a serious thing and it's complete bullshit yeah. that, that um, you know, that they're taking basically bootleg material and using it to, uh, but you can go on chat GPT and say, write a 2000 word. Uh, short story in the style of Mark Graney about, you know, a cat and a butterfly or something. And um, 
you know, it's it's not that sophisticated, but again, it's, uh, you know, a year from now, it might be. Well, an, ar an armed butterfly is very sophisticated, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you could pull that off. <laughs> um, And so your final question this evening is uh, probably the, I know it's a lightning round, but it's probably the most serious question uh, we've asked. What do you think, Travis, what do you, th or who do you think, Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift will have sing at their wedding? <laughs> Are they getting married? That's not a fish, is it? I thought these no. things. I thought these things only lasted, you know. Well, I don't know if if you looked at any of the Super Bowl uh, after party photos, it it was it was all about them. Oh, hey, yeah. the, body, the yeah. body language experts think it's going to last. Oh, really? Or well, People that, magazine. I don't know. Nine out of ten dentists. Where were body okay. experts when I needed them a few years ago? <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> they could have helped me with it with a previous <laughs> with a previous marriage. Um, never occurred to me. Um, <laughs> I I don't maybe they'd have somebody like um, the Who. That's how I, I'd have them. I would say Deep Purple, but um, probably I, 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 Motley Crue is one of the best concerts I ever went to in my life. But then when you see the live Motley, they're Crue touring. Stuff, uh, they're touring yeah, right now. Yeah, it's yeah, crazy. and they should and they shouldn't be. Um, I know my know. wife and I, we just had this conversation. Like, yeah, no, they were good. They were so good live. I mean, even if, even if you didn't like heavy metal, which I did, but even if you didn't, you'd have to go. Okay, that's a super tight, you know, band. It's like in their real, they were, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe she'll sing. Maybe he'll sing. <laughs> he'll sing at his own wedding. Oh, he yeah. sings. He does. He and the yeah, he sang. He and his brother did a Christmas song this year. Oh wow, that's pretty. Yeah, cool. I, I know very little. It's not about good, it. but it's but he. Anyway. <laughs> it's not good, <laughs> but he did it. <laughs> well, hey, my friend, uh, we're gonna raise a glass one more time because. Me too. Number 13, which is my lucky number, by the way. True story. Um, fantastic, as always. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate you guys. I, I hate saying as always because it makes it seem like it's just so, you know, simple to write a freaking great book. But, yeah. Uh, dude, you, you, we, we were just talking to Greg Hurwitz about this the other day, about you and him and how just every time out, I'm just like, shit, man. I'm just like, want to quit writing for the rest yeah, of the time. Yeah, no, no, I, I appreciate you saying that. They, they get tougher and tougher to write, so. You would never um, know. You, you know, it's it's. I always wait for those first reviews and the first feedback. Even even when my editor is like, "Oh, I love it," I'm always like, "He's just glad I turned something in." Like, <laughs> he's just he's happy he's got a book. You know, I'm like, I, it's almost like I don't believe him. And and uh, you know, like, and then you get those first few reviews, and you're like, "Is this person just being nice?" And then it's only once you you start getting that aggregate from people where you can kind of breathe a sigh of relief. But when you know, I'm I'm hard on my writing you know when while i'm doing it and even when i turn it in it's kind of like you know waiting with bated breath to hope hope that people don't hate it so it's nice to hear you guys say that i appreciate it no and yeah. i'm pretty sure uh chat gbt uh is a mark green <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good christopher uh yes John. hell of a book hell Love of an it. interview yes uh talking to mark's definitely at this point like talking to an old friend because he's been on the show i think more than anybody did you say it was six times i believe it's six times amazing i think it's six times he gets the uh we have to buy him the six timer ring it's kind of like a super bowl ring um, i thought we were doing the jackets but he has the we're doing the up. jackets is it 10 times for the ring uh, yeah um, 10 times six times for the jacket 10 times for a ring we got a few four timers a few five timers a couple three timers a lot of two timers. Timer. What's that? A lot of two timers on this show. <laughs> A lot of two timers. Chris, let's not talk about your high school dating life. Uh, anyway, <laughs> everybody, thank you for joining our show tonight. Uh, we hope to see you next time with another great interview with the best storytellers in the world on what's the show called? The Crew Reviews. Cheers. Mine's empty.